This meeting is being recorded. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Dear Lord, thank you for um, allowing us all to gather this evening and just share with one another, um, you know, um, just praise of you and learning more about um, you, Lord. Um, we are excited to learn more about the sanctity of life and the things that you value in your creation and to um, take that knowledge out into the world and share it with others um, so that we can use it to reflect um, the good news of what you have done for all of us. So we look forward to the discussion tonight and we um, just pray that you are able to speak truth into the discussion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so I um, want to, last week we looked at the fact that uh, God's design establishes the sanctity of life, and that human depravity disregards the sanctity of life. We traced that out, and then we looked at how human government is to protect the sanctity of life. We saw last week um, how God uh, gave, uh, shared some of his rights uh, with uh, humanity regarding the safeguarding of the sanctity of life. And so tonight we're going to look <clears throat> at... Um, the issue of our culture uh, of death raging against the sanctity of life. And so primarily what we're talking about is abortion. Um, there's other ways, but this, this is the leading thing. Uh, Al Mohler in his latest book, The Gathering Storm, I like, uh, like uh, these uh, quotes that I took from him. Um, in his chapter on uh, um, the gathering storm over human life. And he he's starts off saying, abortion looms as a great moral scar on the modern age, a singular symbol of the embrace of the culture of death in the most technological advanced nations on earth. That's, that's amazing. Obviously, uh, uh, technological advance didn't do much for us regarding the civility of our uh, uh, civilization. Um, he goes on to say the horror of abortion seems to appear daily and in every and in ever deadlier form in the nation's headlines as states across the country pledge their support for late term abortions. These laws would allow for abortion right up until the moment a child is born. And then this amazing statement, making the womb the most unsafe place for any baby in the United States. That's incredible to think about. Uh, the totality of the English language fails to describe the utterly chilling and abhorrent barbarity of the pro-abortion movement's agenda. So that's the moment that we, that's the cultural moment we find ourselves uh, selves in. Um, and so what, what we should, uh, the, you know, our mindset, uh, what we share is, should be that the law of our land is immoral and unjust. <laughs> that unjust it's, it's, it's dinner time see she doesn't like this <laughs> i don't blame she her should. she says it's good she says goodbye it's dinner time <laughs> <laughs> the law of our land is immoral and unjust and that should be proclaimed loudly and everywhere um but just just to give you a little bit of historical background, 
uh, it wasn't always the law of the land. When the American, this is incredible to me, when the American Medical Association was first formed in 1847, abortion was commonly practiced before quickening. Do you all know what uh, the reference to quickening, what quickening is? Conception, probably. Pardon? Probably conception. Uh, actually, quickening is when the uh, when the mom could first feel the baby in the womb, oh. <laughs> movement or anything in the womb. That was referred, referred to as quickening or enlivening. Uh, it, it's, it's alive. I can feel it move. Um, that was referred to quickening. And back when AMA was uh, first formed in 1847, abortion was commonly practiced only before quickening. Uh, through the efforts of the AMA and anti-obscenity crusaders and, ironically, feminists, abortion became illegal everywhere in the, U, uh, in the U.S. by 1900. So um, at least by 1900, uh, all abortion even that before quickening uh, was illegal everywhere in the US. That's just, that's so hard to imagine now. And as we all know, the uh, key reversal of that legal situation came on January 22nd, 1973, when the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade ruled in favor of abortion. The ruling, and then that was in 73, uh, in 76, they, uh, they extended the ruling. Um, this, this ruling, Roe versus Wade, uh, prevented the states from regulating abortion in the first three months of pregnancy. But it didn't, it didn't limit itself to that. It also ruled that states may not prevent abortion in the last six months of a pregnancy, if it is, that is the abortion is to preserve the life, life or health of the mother. And that same ruling also stipulated that the health of the mother, that terminology included all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age all of those factors relevant to the well-being of the patient. And by the way, in 1976, four, uh, three years later, when they extended it, they extended it, uh, the, they ruled that, the, um, that, uh, that the uh, parents of, a, of, their of their minor daughter uh, were not, it was not required for them to be uh, informed. And also it, it ruled that uh, the father of uh, the baby uh, was not required to be informed. Um, that was the extensions they made in 76. So as, as a result, of Roe versus Wade, the law of the land today is that any abortion is legal until birth if the mother can give the reason that the pregnancy or the child will be an excessive burden or stress on her well being. And since that ruling, we have killed on average one and a half million babies every year for nearly 50 years. My quick arithmetic says that 75 million babies. Yeah. Incredible. What a mural that would make if we painted a picture that included 75 million babies. Wouldn't it? Yes. Yes. I was Not just telling Marilyn today that there will be many, many babies standing up in judgment, pointing yeah. at these people. Yes. Because they deserve the judgment of God. Yeah. They will stand up and point. Yes. Now, yeah, it is. Uh, 
man. And, and what does Jesus say in the gospels? It would be better yep. for that person if the millstone was right. placed around their neck and, and they're thrown into the sea. Um, now, um, if you want to just scroll up a little bit there, Deepak. Yeah. So before we get into uh, reasons, 10 reasons, uh, why we should not abort um, unborn, the unborn. Uh, I want to first talk a little bit about fetal humanity and personhood. Uh, obviously, early on, people talked about how that wasn't a human. It was just a lump of tissue. Uh, but uh, that argument died away very, very quickly. Hmm. Most scientifically informed people know that life begins at conception. When we're dealing with animals or birds or any other organism, the accepted science is that life begins at fertilization. And then from that moment on, from fertilization on, the organism merely unfolds the capacities that belong intrinsically to that uh, to the kind of being it is. Um, and those same scientific facts apply to humans. And in point of fact, uh, because there's been a lot written in the ensuing uh, five decades, um, today, virtually no professional bioethicist denies that human life begins at conception. So what is the problem? If, if, if almost all hold that human life does begin at conception, then, then, then what's the problem? Why, why isn't it seen uh, uh, um, worthy of being protected? Well, the problem is that at least since Descartes, who's a 17th century French philosopher, the mind, uh, there's been a dichotomy drawn between the mind and the body. The mind separated from the body in this way. The mind has been regarded as the authentic self. The body has been reduced to the subpersonal, functioning solely on the level of biology and chemistry. And, and, and that's what explains uh, why being biologically human is no longer thought to confer any moral status or legal protection. To be human is no longer equivalent to being a person. This is, this is the modern theory of person. This is the modern personhood theory. I don't know if you've heard of personhood theory. But it base, it's based on that dualism between the mind and the body. The mind is in the upper story. The body is in the lower story. The mind is what um, um, uh, is regarded as the authentic self. Um, and the body is just material, subpersonal. It's just matter that you control like a car. Um, so anyway, that means that the core question in abortion is the status of the body. Is the human body an integral part of the person sharing in its dignity? And most bioethicists today answer that question in the negative. But the most pr obvious problem, and I think self-refuting problem for this, this theory, this modern theory of uh, uh, this modern personhood theory is that no one can agree on how to define personhood. If personhood is not equated 
with being biologically human, then what is it? And when does it begin? Now, there's, there's lots of answers out there. Peter Singer and others have, been, have written a lot in answer to that question. And they will give you, they will give you anywhere from, well, I don't know, five to 15 key features uh, that um, go, that they say uh, qualify for personhood once, once uh, the human life qualifies as a person, then they qualify, then they qualify for being protected, for being designated uh, with uh, dignity worthy to be, uh, to be protected. The trouble is they, they all have varying uh, um, features that they um, list. Um, and so I, I'm not going to go into all of the different proposals and all of that. I just want to make this statement that uh, simply by asserting that personhood is not connected or equated with being biologically human is just that, an assertion. And um, they are in an absolute total fog to define what personhood is. So um, our best bet as Christians, uh, the only place we can turn to uh, address this challenge of personhood theory, this challenge of this dualism, this modern day dualism between mind and body is to go to scripture. And uh, um, I want to show you there's at least two passages uh, in scripture that clearly, clearly indicates that um, the work of gestation is the work of God uh, forming the life of a person in the womb. And notice I have person in um, uh, italics because I'm not saying just the body, I'm saying the person. Um, would somebody like to read Psalm 139, 13, please? For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Yes. So um, what obviously what David is saying there is um, that God is the one who was presiding over his formation in his mother's womb. And uh, David referred to it not as a mechanical process, but as this personal, skillful work of God. He was the one that was forming David in the womb, knitting him together as a human being in God's own uh, image. And uh, later on, it talks uh, in the one or two verses later, it, 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 or maybe three verses later, it mentions that in the process of forming David as a person, God all, it, that included uh, laying out the days that David was going to have as, as a living human being. Um, and so anyway, and we're also told, we're also told um, with prophets like Jeremiah and others uh, that they were called from the womb to be prophets. So this, this work of God, this person forming work of God is not just a mechanical biological process. He's actually present there uh, presiding over the knitting together 
of this human person, including uh, what they're going to be like, all their traits, all their capacities, everything, um, the number of their days, uh, um, and what God has for them to do, and other things. So that's what David is saying there in Psalm 139, 13. That's a claim that, uh, that God, uh, God's work in the womb during gestation is forming a person. Okay. And then in Job uh, 31, 13 through 15, um, if somebody wants to uh, read that, I find this a very interesting passage. If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Do not the same one form us both within our mother? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Uh, very powerful passage here. Uh, and what you need to do in this passage is follow Job's argument. Um, he's being confronted by his friends saying that he ignored the pleas of his servants. And, um, and Job said he never did that. And he said, and he, and he, in verses 13 through 15, he gives us re his reasoning for why he never did that. He said that uh, uh, he would be without excuse before God if he treated his servant as less than a human equal. And uh, we, need to, we need to remember in that culture, uh, many thought that servants were non-persons and only property. Uh, we have that in our history, don't we? In our country's history, um, thinking of servants as non-persons and only property. Uh, but in his argument, Job doesn't go back to his servants, the, the parents of his servants. He doesn't say, I was born free, they were born slave. It's, it's perfectly legit for me to just treat them as property. Uh, he doesn't do that. He, his argument goes back before birth. And his argument is essentially the same God that fashioned fetus Job also fashioned the fetus of his servants. During the time of gestation, God was the main nurturer and fashioner of both Job and his servants, the same God for both slave and free. And what I want you to see here is Job is arguing why, why it would be uh, wicked to treat his servants as less than a human equal. And the argument is that God created us human persons in the womb. That same fact is true of his servants as it as it is of Job. And so he's saying, if I if if I just ignored the pleas of my servants, when God confronts me about it, what am I going to say? I know that they're equal human beings, equal persons, uh, because the same God fashioned all of us in the womb. So what we get from these passages, I hope you can see this, uh, what we can draw from these two passages is that from the biblical point of view, gestation is the unique, that says walk, but it meant I meant work, is the unique work of God fashioning personhood. And 
here we get to the modern uh, personhood theory, and only God knows how deeply and mysteriously the creation of personhood is woven into the making of a body. Okay, I want to stop right there and ask if you have questions about these two passages, Psalm 139, 13, Job 31, 13 through 15, and what we're drawing out of it. Any questions about any of that? I don't have a question, but more of a comment. Um, seems like uh, a lot of this uh, formed the basis for the arguments that rose up for the abolitionist movement um, in the 1800s, as there were quite a few groups, even preachers, who were using the scriptures in the New Testament regarding, you know, slavery and the seeming acceptance of it to justify, uh, you know, owning slaves and there being a slave class. And my understanding of, you know, from what I've read is a lot of these verses and were used to kind of form the basis of the sanctity of human life and saying like, you know, no, these, these people are of equal status and dignity and image bearing, uh, image bearers of God yes. and should be afforded the same freedom as everyone else. Yeah, and that that is an outstanding point, Brian, because um, uh, our modern day abortionists, um, they are committing the exact kind of discrimination that was committed back in with with the slaves, just as you pointed out. Um, mm -hmm. And also, also same exact as when when. Uh, women were treated as property. In all three cases, when women were treated as property, when slaves were treated as property, and now when uh, the unborn are treated as just uh, bodies that aren't, that don't have worth and dignity uh, as equal to, at least to the mothers, um, in all three cases, they are denying the personhood uh, of those victims. Yeah. Uh, so that's a that's a very good point, Brian. It's an old sin, and and yeah, keeps popping up. Say that again. Keeps coming around in different yes. different ways. Yes, yes, and. Like we saw last week, that's um, that's characteristic of human depravity. That uh, human depravity disregards the sanctity of life, and so we just see this coming up again and again and again. So th that's an, you know, um, that's one way. Uh, that's uh, one way we can um, uh, confront people is, well, this is no different than slavery. This is no different than when women were treated property, uh, treating the unborn this way, treating them like uh, uh, that the woman's, the mother's will is sovereign and decisive on whether um, that unborn baby lives or dies. It's kind of like um, they're basically, like I said, they're making a choice to care more, or they're making a choice to care only about one life. Absolutely. They're, they're placing a higher priority on one life versus another life, which ties into the same thing you guys are talking about, like slavery. Like one yeah. life is higher or better, and the other is lower. But here's for something for us to keep in mind. Um, there's a lot of people that, that are pro-choice that maybe never even heard of personhood theory. Um, 
this uh, separating the mind from the body and denying the dignity of, and worth of the body and therefore uh, justifying abortion on that basis, that is the hidden premise of the abortion logic. Regardless of where, whether uh, the abortion supporter recognizes it or not. And we can point that premise out um, and point out that they're, this is just an old sin coming back around again. A horrific are they, sin. Are they saying that like, because the fetus doesn't have a brain yet, like it's not considered life or what, what does that mean exactly? Well, they can't say that. They, uh, they, they, uh, they, they cannot say they have a brain because by, I mean, uh, by eight weeks, they have a functioning brain, functioning heart, functioning liver, uh, fluids are getting cleansed. I mean, there's, uh, Randy Alcorn has a book, I think, where he goes through a lot of those details and all that. So they can't say that, that it doesn't have a mind, but they're not referring, uh, a brain. They're not referring, when they refer to mind, they're not referring to brain. Okay. They're talking about, uh, and I don't know if they would call it immaterial part or not, because a lot of them, there's a lot of them that are naturalists. So there's no immaterial part of the human. So how they distinguish between mind and brain, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but what they're talking about is cognition, self-awareness, uh, those sorts of things. So uh, the right to make a choice. Uh, yes, but the, but the problem is uh, they know and we know that those things are far from being fully developed after the birth line. Uh, I think I think I've heard that, uh, and I don't know how they how they come up with this stuff, but that a baby's not doesn't start becoming self aware until around the age of six months. How they determine that I don't know, but but the fact is that we have all kinds of laws protecting babies uh, after birth. I mean, some of those in philosophical circles, those, those laws are being challenged. Um, um, Peter Singer is one uh, bioethicist who's done a lot of writing on it for many years. Uh, and it makes your skin crawl to, to read uh, how he justifies infanticide. Um, but... Um, so, yeah, they're talking about cognition, self-awareness, uh, and things like that. And uh, that that is what forms a person. And that the unborn in the womb doesn't have that. So essentially, they're kind of grasping at straws to just form some kind of like um, reason as to why this is okay. Yeah, to a reason to treat, since they cannot deny the humanity of the fetus, fetus they um, separate body from mind and say the body is subpersonal and it's, you can, you have total control, you can do whatever you want uh, with the body. Um, but um, it is the person. Uh, it's the development of personhood that makes a person um, worthy of protection, that confers dignity and makes them worthy of protection. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, uh, uh, well, it's certainly indefensible in scripture. And scripture does not make that dichotomy, as we just saw. Those passages 
um, show that from conception, God is present in the womb, uh, forming this person. And we have no idea um, how deeply and mysteriously this creation of the person is woven into uh, the making of the body, the developing of the body. Uh, Hasn't the same philosophy extended itself to um, adult, uh, well, not adult, but I mean, people who are of certain ethnicities? And naturally, I'm thinking right away of the Holocaust during World War II. Yes. Jews were thought of subhuman, I, I assume, by exactly. By exactly. the Nazis. That's and another, of course, that's another there example. There are other, other, like the Uyghurs now, from what I understand, in yeah. China. Yeah. Um, and of course, ultimately, it seems to me that that could be very well applied to Christians. Christians are so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. crazy that they must not be people, must not be persons. Yeah. So, genocide. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, five or six decades ago, the uh, or longer even maybe six or seven decades ago, the church was considered an, uh, a central part of the community. Now, <laughs> now the church is not only considered fringe, but the lunatic fringe of uh, mm -hmm. uh, community. Yes. So, all righty. I also want to point out that the Bible treats the unborn in the same way it treats babies that have been born. Um, you could read that in Exodus 21, 22 through 25. Um, and let's see, how are we doing on time? Um, yeah, uh, Deepak, you want to read that passage or anybody, anybody who has that pack passage, whoever has the passage, can you read that? When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Okay, now notice this is not striking the infant outside of the womb. womb. This is striking the woman and it injuring uh, the infant in the womb. Uh, and if it causes harm, um, then the, the principle of uh, uh, lex talionis uh applies uh life for life tooth for tooth whatever harm it causes that is to be the degree of the punishment so um so life in the womb is treated the same as life outside of the womb and then compare those two verses luke 144 with Luke 2.12. Somebody wants to read those two passages. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Yeah, so it's same baby, same baby when uh, um, in same term, same Greek term. So uh, when Christ was in the womb, uh, he was worshiped and um, outside of the womb, he, uh, they came to worship him as well. Uh, so there was the fact that he was in the womb in Luke 1.44, uh, didn't make a difference. Um, so the point being, uh, 
the unborn are accorded the same worth and dignity as those already born. Okay. So here's the conclusion. Here's the conclusion that we come to here uh, regarding fetal humanity and personhood. Biblically, the destruction of conceived human life, whether it is embryonic, fetal, or viable, is an assault on the unique person-forming person work of God. So that is the biblical point of view. Now, so any Mike, question? Yes. Excuse me. I, I'm a little confused about those two passages in Luke because one of the babies is John the Baptist. The other is Christ, right? Um, Luke 144, speaking of John the Baptist. I thought it was yeah. both of them. that's elizabeth speaking there oh yeah that's right okay so what it's saying it's it's referring to the baby uh that's right you're right um john the baptist leaping in her womb it's, it's right. describing it's describing what that baby is doing inside the womb and uh luke 2 12 is describing a mary's baby um uh, outside of the wombs, using the same term, and uh, um, you certainly, the point being here, is you certainly wouldn't uh, see, you wouldn't find bioethicists uh, uh, saying that babies leap for joy in the womb. Yeah. <laughs> so they're describing uh, baby life in the womb, in the same way they've described baby life outside of the womb is the point. No, you're right. Thank you for pointing okay. that out. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Now I've seen lots of lots of arguments uh, against abortion. And uh, one the one presentation I like the best is John Piper, maybe what, 20 years ago, wrote this book, uh, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. And one chapter, chapter of it was on trumpeting uh, the cause of the unborn. And uh, he presented, um, he wasn't, he presented uh, 10 reasons. Um, why the unborn should not be aborted. And um, um, so I've just listed those 10 reasons uh, here. And you can find other, um, you can find other presentations and all that. What I like about this is the comprehensive biblical argument. Here's my thinking on this. Um, we're, I don't feel that we need to argue and go into great length to argue uh, for life in the womb being referred to as human life, that, that human life begins at conception because only people who are very um, biologically uninformed or those um, whose minds are so made up um, that, they, that they won't even listen would argue that that's not human life in the womb. Uh, that's just not the, the state of the argument uh, nowadays has moved way past that. I do... I do understand that there are still people that think that that's not human life in the womb, but uh, um, most do. 
And so um, what I wanted to concentrate on is this um, biblical argument. You can add you can add other things to it. I mean, for instance, we know that pro-choice people know that uh, that is human life in the womb deserving to be protected. And how do we know that? Well, in 38 states, there are fetal homicide laws that um, uh, if you kill a baby in the mother's womb, that that is uh, homicide and treated as homicide. Most states, I think, or maybe all states, make one exception to their fetal homicide laws, and that's for abortion. So we know. I mean, just consider that. Having a fetal homicide law saying if, if, if you do something to a woman, whether it's a car wreck, whether it's a personal assault or whatever, if you do something to a pregnant woman that causes uh, the baby inside her womb to die, uh, that 38 in 38 states, they say that is homicide and you'll be prosecuted for homicide, but they make an exception for abortion. That tells us clearly they know that that's human life in there and that uh, it is worth protecting except in the case of abortion. So we know that pro-choice people know that that's human life in the womb uh, deserving to be protected. Um, and there's, there's many other examples like that, that that we could bring up. I wanted to go through this uh, comprehensive uh, biblical argument of why um, the unborn should not be aborted. So let's just work our way through this. Pardon? I have a question. Oh, yes. So in response, because a lot of what I know from a friend of mine who has had an abortion and other people that have talked about abortion is that um, the main reason that a lot of people feel that it's okay is when a woman is raped. And so when we're trying to essentially like love on someone and speak to them in like, say for example, the woman did get raped and she got pregnant of it and she wants to abort it because she cannot handle the emotional and mental, like how as Christians should we approach that? And like, like how do we go about that? Because that's the strongest argument they have is with rape victims. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that. That's one of the, that's one of the arguments, one of these 10 arguments and that's a very good question. But I, let me just say from the outset, another argument that they make is what uh, What about in the case where the mother's life is endangered and the mother's gonna die if, if the child right. uh, isn't aborted? Let me, let me make this, and I'm, and I'm not being heartless toward this, the situation, the horrible, unthinkable situation of a woman being raped and, and then uh, pregnant as a result. Um, in, a lot of these, in a lot of these arguments that they come up with, or these few arguments they can't come up with, those are rarely the case. It is very rarely the case. So what I'm saying is they go to the very rare cases and make an emotional argument against abortion. I mean, against uh, preventing abortion. And then once they stop the prevention of abortion, they use abortion for any argument uh, other than those two that they used to argue for the prevention of abortion. 
You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so um, we've got to we've got to be aware of that that there is this propensity to use an argument that will not, in the actual reality of the cases, that will not be the basis for decisions to abort. It's only an argument uh, that, that appeals to our, our empathetic nature to get concessions for abortion. Okay. I hope that makes sense and doesn't sound too heartless. So Mike, does that follow the same reasoning of when they say, you know, now you can find out genetically um, if there's any, you know, genetic issues, you can find out between six and nine weeks and that that should also be a reason why you can have an abortion. Is that the same line of thinking? Yes, yes. And that, and we're gonna, and, and both of those questions, we're gonna direct, we're gonna answer directly here in one of these 10 arguments, one or two of these 10 arguments. Those are very good questions, but, but you see what they go to. Yeah. Here's what, what they will not do. Here's what they will not do. They will not, and, and, and John Piper actually challenged uh, the Minneapolis Star, I think, or the Tribune or whatever. Um, uh, uh, he, he wrote into him and he challenged them to show the picture of a 23 year, a 23 week old fetus uh, that has just been aborted right alongside a 22 or 23 week uh, old baby that was having uh, in the womb that was having surgery on it uh, to get it uh, to to correct issues so that it can survive. Right. And he, he's saying, I dare you to take those two pictures and lay them side by side in the people in the paper and then see what people think. Um, so that's what they won't do. What they will do is they'll bring up these exceptional cases and, uh, try to appeal to our empathetic nature to get concessions for the taking of life in the womb. Okay. Let's work through these let's work through these reasons. The first reason is, is, is clear. Uh, God commanded, you shall not murder. Now, King James version, uh, King James translation uses the English word kill instead of the word murder. But the Hebrew word used there in Exodus 20, 13, uh, always means violent personal killing that is actually murder or is accused of murder. It is that word is never used of killing in a war or in judicial execution. So the Bible draws a distinction between those two things. Um, for example, in Numbers 35, 19, the term for murderer is the same word used in the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. Whereas in that same verse, the murderer shall be put to death. The word put to death is a general word that can describe legal executions. So what number 3519 is saying is the one who violently personally kills someone um, and, uh, and is, and, uh, the evidence, um, uh, shows it, uh, that person will be put to death. So don't let the word kill in the King James version or any other versions that, 
that translate the word kill in Exodus 20, 13. Don't let that throw you. It is the Hebrew word for murder. And it is distinguished from uh, killing in a war or, or judicial execution. And remember last week we saw in, uh, in Genesis chapter 9, uh, when God was uh, renewing covenant with Noah, and also in Romans chapter 13, uh, God gave uh, some of his responsibilities to civil government. This um, uh, putting to death those that uh, murder someone created in the image of God. So um, that's simply God sharing some of his rights or prerogatives with civil authority. That's, that's why vigilantism is, is wrong. That's why personal vengeance is wrong. God shared some of those rights and prerogatives with civil authority. He didn't share it with just every person. Okay, that's a key point to make. All right, so first of all, um, it is a violent personal killing, uh, abortion is, um, of a person. And secondly, um, abortion is the destruction of conceived human life, whether embryonic, fetal, or viable. It's an assault on the unique person-forming work of God. We just, we just went through those passages when we were looking at uh, fetal personhood. Uh, Psalm 139, 13, Job 31, 13 through 15. Thirdly, um, aborting unborn humans falls under the repeated biblical ban against shedding innocent blood. I'm sure, uh, as you've read through the Old Testament, you've you heard that repeated, that ban uh, against shedding innocent blood, and uh, and the land of Israel was would be judged, the people in it would be judged if there was unrequited um, shedding of innocent blood going on. Uh, uh, I mean, um, shedding of innocent blood that was not judged and taken care of uh, according to the law, wasn't dealt with according to the law, then the whole land and the people in it would be judged. Look at, uh, somebody wanna read that passage in Psalm 106? And then somebody can read Jeremiah 22, 3. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to Beam. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Okay, that was uh, uh, probably most likely Moloch worship, where they sacrificed their, their babies to the god Moloch. Canaanite god Moloch. Can you imagine? I, just, I cannot conceive of that. And yet I say I cannot conceive of that, but yet look what we're doing at a rate of a million and a half babies a year just in our country. Um, uh, okay, Jeremiah 22, 3. Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who had been robbed, and do not and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Yes. And so uh, the point being here is surely the blood of the unborn is as innocent as any blood that flows in the world. So this, this should be a call to us whenever we read that the ban against shedding innocent blood, that should be telling us uh, um, that is exactly what's going on in our country at, at uh, 
horrific proportions, the shedding of innocent blood. That's another reason um, uh, abortion should be illegal, should not be allowed. Mike. Okay. Um, Mike, we have a question. Yes. So would you say that, because like back in biblical times, Old Testament times, and they would sacrifice um, the babies to like other gods and other idols, right? Yes. Would you say that like, that's what we're doing now? Are we sacrificing children to essentially other gods or idols or is it different? No, I think, I think it's the same thing. The only thing that's different is the idol. Mm -hmm. right. And it was Moloch. It was, an, it was a metal image. Get Well, I, I don't want to gross this all out. But it was Moloch was a metal image that they would roll their babies down the arms of Moloch into this fire. Um, but but here, here they uh, um, their God is their is their own self. Um, is is uh, what they want for themselves, um, their dreams, their plans, whatever. Whatever they feel that that uh, this pregnancy is interfering with, um, that's their god, and and they're sacrificing their baby to that god. I mean, in um, my understanding, uh, and what I've read is when when they abort babies that are near term. Uh, the first thing they do is they give them digoxin. They inject digoxin into them and cause them to have a massive heart attack. And then they go in and get the child out of the womb, uh, the dead baby out of the womb. But I mean, so yeah, that's, it's, you, Heather, you can say yes. It's it, it's exactly equivalent. The only thing that's changed is the god. So the idol is ourselves. Yep. Which, like, so our culture is just worshiping themselves, and it's all about like self love and you know, like your own truth and things like that. That makes sense. Actually. Yes. Yes. And remember, we talked about a little earlier. We talked about this dichotomy between mind and body. The mind uh, is, is the authentic self, and the body is subpersonal. It's just matter that you can control, like driving a car. Uh, that's also the same dichotomy that's behind um, all of this self-expression, finding your own identity, transgenderism, and the whole nine yards. Is that same exact um, dichotomy your body does not contribute to your person it also allows them to in their own minds to justify abortion okay number four uh the bible frequently expresses the high priority God puts on the protection and provision and vindication of the weakest, most helpless, and most victimized members of the community. Somebody want to read uh, uh, Psalm 82, 3 and 4? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Yes. Um, and certainly the unborn falls into this category. Um, okay. So now number five. This is, this is what Heather and Silky were asking about earlier. This one right here. Uh, and this is so important to get. By judging difficult and even tragic human life as a worse evil than taking life, abortionists 
contradict the widespread teaching that God loves to show his gracious power through suffering and not just by helping people avoid suffering. Um, the victim of rape being impregnated would fall into this category right here. Um, babies having genetic disabilities um, would fall into this category. Um, so what, they're, what that argument is saying, Heather, is, is that um, me being raped uh, and, um, and having to bear this child is a worse evil than me taking the life of this child. So that's the value judgment that's being made right there. And so what they're saying is I should not have to go through this suffering. And yes, it's horrific. It's tragic. But that is a life inside you. That is an innocent life inside you. Um, and so now the situation has changed. You've You've got innocent, uh, dignified life inside you. Um, no matter how illegitimate becoming pregnant and how evil or illegitimate becoming pregnant was, that child is legitimate. There's no illegitimate children. None. There are evil, illegitimate, and dubious uh, ways um, for that mom to become pregnant and for that child to spring into existence. But the moment of conception, that is, that is not an illegitimate child. There are no illegitimate childs. So that's, that's just the value that uh, uh, God places on human life because think of it this way the moment fertilization happened god is in that womb doing his wonderful work of knitting and forming a person uh, made in his own image that's what's going on and um and so abortion would be, in that instance, would be the woman deciding that, that my having to bear this child and, and, uh, and raise this child uh, is a worse evil than me... Um, uh, interrupting this intimate person, unique person forming work of God in my womb and uh, destroy that work. I'm sure that um, it pops into our minds, the whole concept of um, a baby being uh, fertilized in a test tube, test tube mm -hmm. babies. Uh, yeah. I know uh, that's probably not a very good term. I, I apologize for that. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, as you said, if it's fertilization, that life is beginning right there. Yeah. And I that's another, know. yeah, that's another dubious. Uh, yeah. The more you separate um, fertilization from the natural way, uh, from the, uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily become wrong. It certainly can be. I mean, in a lot of these cases, there's a 
lots of fertilized ovum that are destroyed. In exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but um, even in vitro um, fertilization, uh, a baby that's born from that, or a baby that's that uh, um, a fertilization that happens, a fetal, an embryo, and a fetal, those those are uh, are legitimate. Uh, that's legitimate life there, not that's illegitimate. Right. No matter how dubious or or questionable, I mean, some of these things are hard to determine. But um, no matter how questionable uh, the form of becoming pregnant is, there is no illegitimate children. And um, same thing, Silky, when you were uh, asking if this applies to people getting scans, yeah. getting blood tests, to, uh, and uh, yes, it's the exact same thing. Uh, they are making the decision that it is a worse evil for me to have a baby that's born with spina bifida or a baby that's born with uh, Down syndrome. Uh, that is a uh, me having to bear that child and raise that child is a worse evil than taking that child's life. So, uh, and uh, the thing that Piper pointed out that I liked is that God loves to show his gracious power through suffering and not just by helping people avoid suffering. Uh, that, and that doesn't mean that we should seek suffering for ourselves or others, but it does mean that suffering is generally portrayed in the Bible as the necessary and God-ordained, though not God-pleasing, plight of this fallen world. Um, so let's just read some of these verses. Um, um, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll just let you read them all yourself um, because I wanna make sure we get through all 10 of these arguments. Uh, but in those verses that I've cited there, um, uh, it's, it's showing, um, suffering as, uh, the necessary and God ordained plight of this fallen world. Uh, uh, Ezekiel 1832 is interesting. Um, God is pleading. I think that's the passage. God is pleading for people why they would they die in their sin he he, he uh um takes no pleasure ezekiel 1832 says god takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked so he doesn't god it, it's not that suffering is pleasing to god but it but what he uses uh, what he accomplishes using suffering is pleasing to him. And, and so that's why he uses suffering. And uh, suffering is a reminder to us of our fallenness. This, uh, what's, uh, it reminds us of what's wrong with the universe. It is a reminder um, to us. Um, uh, what 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 was the um, C.S. Lewis quote about pain? Pain is God's megaphone to a morally insensitive world. Same thing here. Um, but God also causes suffering to become something glorious in the life to come. Um, so any questions about that? That's that's a that's a hard point. 
Um, yeah. so my question yeah. is, uh, yeah. so essentially, not to sound harsh or anything, but it's convenience of not dealing with our problems. Like going back to Genesis, when Adam didn't want to confess to God that he partaken of the fruit, and so he blamed Eve. It's yeah. always us just trying to run in the opposite direction. So yeah. in terms of like the rape thing, um, it would essentially just be the mother not being willing to deal with her own emotional struggle in order to have this child and bring this child into the world. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yes, and essentially, uh, she's saying uh, that that God couldn't use this in her life to show His love and power, uh, and to to do things in her life that He couldn't do otherwise if if she, if she hadn't have been assaulted and raped. But for the person, for the young woman who doesn't know God, doesn't believe in God, right? And you're trying to minister this to her. How? How would you say these things? I would just stress the uh, the life that's in her womb, and that that's innocent life that wasn't the baby's fault, and and um, uh, now she's in a situation where she needs to protect this life to focus on protecting the life um and if you know pursue pursue um legal recourses against the rapist but but protect the life of this baby silky uh, you have anything to add to that Add to that, I, I was going to say a lot of times the, um, the, the justification that people feel is when they say, well, it's not fair. It's not fair that this happened to me yeah. so, or I can do, I can have this abortion because that wasn't fair to me. Yes. Yes. He's, yeah. And so, um, Obviously, it's not fair to the baby, and the baby's paying the ultimate price. Mm -hmm. So I know firsthand what this looks like, and so I guess my question is, when someone is in a deep depression after suffering such a horrendous thing in their life, while now having the hormones going of a baby in their womb and feeling overtaken and succumbed by those things, how do you minister to that woman in that time? Because I deal with depression and I know how dark and how tempting it becomes to just stay in a place of only looking at yourself rather than the child. So how would you go about talking to that girl? Oh, that's, you have to love them. You have to love them through it. Yeah, that's that's a tough question. Um, clearly, it's going to take. I would think. I mean, um, you would probably know better than I on how to to help a person in uh, struggling with depression like that, but it's gonna take talking to them clearly and, um, and speaking the truth into their pain. Um, and I think also, I think also um, uh, speaking about God I'm not saying I'm not saying just keep grabbing them by the nap of the neck and 
and shouting the gospel at them, okay? I'm not saying that. But clearly sharing the love of God with them. Um, uh, maybe, maybe doing some research and finding um, uh, organizations or people that, uh, um, that you can hook them up with or talking to them about what God's doing in, in another person's life under similar circumstances. So um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you a, a thought out um, um, answer to that question and, and, a, and, a, and a plan, but those are the things that come to my mind. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, I just, I've experienced one of my best friends um, when we were in high school. She had an abortion. Yeah. And it's haunted me ever since because uh, she had a few of them and now she has three children, but she had the abortions in between the children. Oh, wow. And that made me really angry because I'm like, how do you just get to choose which ones to keep and which ones to essentially throw away? <laughs> but yeah. in the same instance, I saw her struggle deeply with all the hormones that come with being pregnant and what happened to her and the violence that took place and the trauma that took place and I didn't know how to be there for her and I want to learn from that mistake and know how to be there for someone next time yeah yeah well I mean there's there's there is pregnancy crisis centers there, there are, I'm sure, lots of organizations that uh, you could talk to or, or uh, more than a few, let me put it, this, put it that way, that you can talk to that, uh, that would um, be able, that, that you could possibly hook them up with and, and that are experienced at walking people through this, uh, women in these kind of crises, uh, walking th through the crisis with them. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, that's out there. I, I just, I should, have, I should have a list of those, but I don't. Um, uh, but also here's the other thing is, um, like if you're working with her, she could have a lot of guilt over those abortions. And so speaking to her about the love and forgiveness of God in Christ uh, could be very helpful too if she's, if she's uh, dealing um, with, with uh, a lot of guilt. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's go through these these other ones. Uh, I know that was a tough one. That's okay. Um, it is a sin of presumption to justify abortion by taking comfort in the fact that all these little children will go to heaven or even being be given full adult life in the resurrection. Uh, think about that. This same justification could be used to justify killing one-year-olds or any heaven-bound believer. That's right. Uh, so it is presumption to uh, step into God's place and try to make assignments to heaven or to hell. Our duty is to obey God, not to play God. And then this next one, number seven, the Bible commands us to rescue our neighbor who is unjustly being led away to death. Somebody want to read those two passages, those two verses in Proverbs 24?
Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Yeah, so um, notice what he says. If you even pretend like you don't know this is going on, doesn't God know your heart? You're not fooling God. Um, there is, and, and there is absolutely no significant scientific, medical, social, moral, or religious reason for putting the unborn in a class where this passage does not apply to them. We have a million and a half unborn babies uh, being unjustly led away to death, million and a half per year in this country. And there, there is no scientific, medical, social, moral, or religious reason for putting them in a different category so that this verse doesn't apply. And what we're doing is we're just piling biblical uh, uh, perspective on top of biblical perspective here. And, and what I hope you're seeing is how immense uh, the biblical perspective is regarding the sanctity of life and the necessity to safeguard it and how God will hold us accountable, uh, hold people accountable for the shedding of innocent blood, for the murdering of life. Um, um, number eight there, aborting unborn children falls under Jesus's rebuke of those who spurn children as inconvenient and unworthy of the Savior's attention. Um, maybe somebody read those, those that Mark passage and that Luke passage. He took a little children who he placed among them. Taking the children in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Yes. Yes. Um, and then Luke 8, 15, 15, 16. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belonging, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Okay. So to reject uh, or spurn children. Um, uh, Jesus rebuked his, uh, his uh, disciples about uh, spurning children as un unworthy of his attention. <clears throat> and it's, it's interesting. Remember the uh, passage in Luke that we read earlier? Luke chapter one with Elizabeth, the um, unborn infant in Elizabeth's womb, that word for infant in Luke 18, referring to children that are outside the womb, is the exact same word for infant uh, that was used regarding the unborn infant in Elizabeth's womb in Luke 1. So uh, abortion uh, falls under this rebuke of Jesus. <coughs> And then this ninth, ninth reason, it is the right of God the maker to give and to take human life. It is not our individual right to make this choice. Birth and death are the prerogatives of God. Somebody want to read Job 121? And he said, naked I came from mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. So uh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. 
uh, he gave birth and he gives he gives birth and he gives death. Those are God's prerogatives. And um, it is not our individual right to make this choice. Now we have we have uh, evil government laws that give people the right to make that kind of decision with life in the womb. But it's that's just exactly what it is. It's evil. It's government forsaking its God-given responsibility to, to safeguard uh, that life in the womb, to safeguard uh, the sanctity of life. And then finally, number 10 here, saving faith in Jesus Christ uh, brings forgiveness of sins and hope for eternity. Surrounded by such omnipotent love, every follower of Jesus is free from the greed and fear that might lure a person to forsake these truths in order to gain money or avoid reproach. I mean, and those are two of the biggest reasons that are given. Afraid of uh, uh, avoiding reproach or um, uh, some sort of uh, personal gain. Uh, it's not the right time. Uh, I can't afford it. You know, um, I've got my career. I, I can't afford to, uh, to affect my career this way. Uh, that sort of stuff. Believers um, have every reason to feel free from the greed and fear that might lure a person to forsake these truths and these first nine uh, reasons that we went through in order to gain money or avoid, avoid reproach. Okay, we're going to stop there. Um, uh, I'll ask Deepak, could you uh, close us in prayer and then stop the recording and then we can, uh, we can talk. You can ask more questions or you can talk about other things. Uh, so why don't you go ahead, Deepak, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Um, thank you that it's relevant to us, even when we talk about difficult topics. And we just pray for what we talked about today, that um, um, yeah, just what's going on in our culture around us, um, the killing of innocent babies. I pray that um, that you would put an end to it. Um, yes. That we um, get better leaders who would change our laws. And um, as, as a culture, that we would have a change of heart and we would learn to value life. And I pray that um, that is on your people that we would be those who do not care for our own comfort, but we would learn to suffer well um, and um, that we would bring about the change that you want um, in the world around us. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.